Welcome to the Game Breakers podcast, where we look to bring you uh, tips, insights and experience from the world of sport. My name is Rob Nicolay, and as always, I'm joined by my co-host, Danny Wilson. But today, we are joined by a proud Cumbrian, who is a former Leeds Rhinos Academy winning coach, along with being assistant coach at Leeds, Wigan and Widnes Vikings, whilst also being involved with the international game with Great Britain, England, France, Russia and Serbia, and now working both at Salford and a lecturer at the University of Central Lancashire, Stu Wilkinson. Thanks for joining us, Stu. Thanks for having me, gentlemen. No problem. Yeah, thanks, for, thanks for giving us your time, Stu. I think Rob nearly collapsed with that <laughs> introduction there. Uh, take a breath. breath. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to criticise him because he missed Wales out. Oh, Paul. Oh. <laughs> that would have finished him off. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Um, yeah, so we'll, we'll, we'll jump straight into it, Stu. Um, obviously, a, a question that we like to, to get straight off the bat and, uh, throw at everybody is to open up and, and ask you about yourself, giving us insight and, and describing yourself as a person um, first and foremost, and then we'll and then we'll get on with it. Mm. Um, yeah, so I was born born and bred in Cumbria. Um, I was like everybody else, a mad keen sportsman. I wanted to be a professional soccer player. My dad was a professional soccer player. Uh, and he played for, for Blackpool, Man City, and Oldham, and that's what I wanted to do. And I didn't really discover rugby league till quite, it was always there because it's a northern town um, and it's rugby leagues everywhere, but I didn't really play the game till, till my mid teens, really, when I got into it. Um, and things took off from there. I, I, I was assigned professional quite early, and, and in my early 20s, I'd, I'd, um, I'd signed a contract for Wests, uh, which is the Brisbane comp then. And, um, I spent a lot of time there throughout my, 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 my life. Um, and then I came back to the UK, um, sort of finished off playing and developed myself even further um, and started to coach. Um, so I, even when I was finishing off playing at Barra, I was, I was looking after to young kids and things like that and, I, and then sort of moved into, into coaching, um, pretty much like you guys, just at community level to start with. Uh, I did that for a reason, really, because, you know, I, I didn't know coaching, I didn't know kids, and I needed to learn coaching. Um, and, yeah, we can use our connections to get academy coaching jobs, and it was just sort of kicking off and in and around the, the mid-90s. Um, but I sort of I, I, I made my way into the professional game just by uh, volunteering on, on uh, national pathways. Um, and, we, you know, I, ju, ju, if you like what it looked like then... Um, you, 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 I volunteered on the, on, on the national pathway. I got at a, at a coaching position, so I was working with the best kids in the country. So now you're talking about Cookie and Orny and all people like that when I first set off. Um, Danny Maguire and all those type of people, Jamie Jones and City and people like that. I got in a coaching job and the head coach of England Academy then was Mike Gregory, God rest his soul. And he kept coming down to chat to me um, about some of the stuff I was using. And uh, we had like a, a personal friend um, and talking about like you guys making your network work for you. And, and I suppose I should, should say this now for any young coach or any people working in, in talent development, exactly like you two guys have done, is uh, your, uh, your network is your major currency. Okay. Uh, the stronger your network, the greater your opportunities. Uh, and I've always been a big believer in that. So um, in essence, don't be scared to volunteer your, your, your skills and your workforce to coaching because you know, you're, you're only a stone's throw away from, from, from the next big step, if you like, or another opportunity. Uh, Andy Platt, who, who, when I was playing in Western Brisbane, he, he lived with me for a short while and we shared some good experience. And obviously he kicked on uh, when he came back to him with St. Helens and Wigan and became Great Britain captain and stuff. He's really good friends with Mike. And uh, he came back to him because he was talking to a friend of yours, Andy. Um, do you fancy a brew at dinner time? And this is on National Camp up at Amplethorpe. And um, Mike said, do you want to be my assistant with the Great Britain Academy? Um, I said, too right. And, and that was like my big breakthrough into, into like that network of people. It was really exclusive then. There wasn't many, as many opportunities. And there wasn't the funding around today. And there wasn't the positions either. Um, but we work with Mike went really well. And we, we worked together for a number of years. We, we toured with New Zealand and Australia and we were the first team to win in Australia, in New Zealand. And we became the first uh, bunch of kids that, that beat the Australian school boys. And, and that went well. Um, 
Uh, I remember um, uh, at the time Gary Etherington was, 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 was in Australia when we were touring Australia with the academy. And there was about, you know, maybe five or six Leeds Rhinos Academy players that were, um, were, were in the group. And I remember he, he asked me, he, said, oh, he was taking them out for dinner at the, the Radisson in, in, in Manly. Do you want to join us? And then he, he mentioned about um, a job coming up as um, the player performance manager at Leeds Rhinos and if I would be interested in it. Um, so I got interviewed and I got the job. Now that was your first player performance manager ever. So Leeds Rhinos and the RFL bought joint funding like they do today. And it was a performance manager in them days. Um, and I spent nearly 10 years at Leeds doing that job and, and turning to a head of youth. Um, but again, coaching kept pulling me out of youth into, into coaching. And, 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 and uh, in the end, I worked with, as a first team coach with Daryl Powell. Uh, Malcolm really and them guys and then Tony Smith came and I worked as Tony Smith's assistant for a couple of years um, and, and, and Dean Bell was was at Leeds when I first went there and he went to he went to Wigan and he was always asking if I'd go there and in the end I got an offer I couldn't refuse so I left um, Leeds to go to Wigan and spent two or three years at Wigan just coaching now though so I'd, I'd sort of left the talent development stuff even though I've been quite passionate about it and when we get to like some things mistakes and probably that's what I'm back that full loop now, so I should have really stuck out that, even though coaching came naturally and quite easy to me. Um, kept, uh, that was going for a bit, and then I started to do some retraining, so I moved part time uh, at Widnes. So I got, and in one year I did a master's, and I did my, my teaching degree in one year. So I did like, so I went part time to study. So um, I wanted to sort of exit the sport then. And, um, as, as being full time, and then I ended up working for the RFL um, and, and working in Europe with them uh, as, as they started to develop the coaches in Europe for the next World Cup, like the Serbia, the Russians, the Italians, and stuff like that. So I worked on that international program uh, for the RFL, and then started to work with them full time on a, a national player development manager role. Um, and then finally uh, got in a position where I could I could leave the sport. Uh, and moving to higher education because um, I, I mean I'll be honest with you I, I've always looked for uh, rugby leagues that big all right sports huge and now I'm, I'm, I'm able to you know to proudly say I've worked with with, with coaches from Man United and I've worked in at, at professional soccer clubs like Derby County and, 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 and Notts Forest I've worked in some of the Premiership rugby union clubs I'm working with top gymnastic coaches um, so I wanted to, you know, my passion for coaching and particularly talent development has took me on that journey now. So, but my passion is still rugby league. So I still um, coach a couple of years a week with Salford and I've been there about five or six years, part-time, voluntary and stuff like that. Um, and I'm coaching Serbia national team. So um, I do at least one week, one, one, one sort of few hours a week. Uh, communicating with the players and the workforce that supports the players over in Serbia in Belgrade. So, um, does that help you a bit? <laughs> it's really unbelievable. You're listening to that and you think, wow, what a, what a rich and kind of profitable experience you've had. Very varied. Worked with some fantastic people in there. Some of the names you're throwing about and the lessons you'd have probably learned. And I'm sure they'd learn off you along the way. Probably. Yeah. Must have been Rob's thing where to start. <laughs> you know, working with Andy Platt, he got he, uh, he gave me my first coaching gig. That's all about your network. We met twenty years earlier as players, and he gets a, he gets his first coaching gig, 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 gig at Workington, and, uh, and asked me to be his assistant. So, you know, and, and it's nice when uh, such uh, iconic people, um, I'm, I'm allowed to uh, sort of boast that I've, I've got a good relationship with Paul Cullen. You know, um, an iconic person from Warrington has been great to work with. Um, the experiences. We coached England together, we won the Federation Shield, and then we ended up working together. And it's you know, kind of witness me being so many interesting things. You know, this conversation could, could go anywhere. Let's see where it goes. The, yeah. the, you touch on when you talk about coaching and like talent development, it's almost as you, you, you're describing those are two different, two different things. How far apart are they, or how close are they, and, and how do you kind of embed both of those in your in your professional practice? 
I think if you're if you're working on academies like you know we do, guys, I think it's the same thing. I think you know they're quite close, aren't they? But you know, first, you know, when you're coaching in Super League, it's not about that. It's about just you know, well, you can and the margins are so are so small, aren't they? Um, and then they, they inherit our players, so they've already got good habits, haven't they? You know what I mean? And collected them, we've helped nurture them, and things like that. So, you know, really trying to to do your research and outmaneuver a team that you're playing at the weekend in a short period of time is quite intense pressure environment. Isn't it? And it's all about, and you're just looking at the play the ball all the time, aren't you? Or, or where a team's weak, or where you're going to lay the line this week, and and what sexy stuff you might be able to catch them with. Um, it just becomes about that and how intense that is, isn't it? Um, and how everything's got to fit into that in terms of their recovery and, and the, the conditioning and stuff like that. It really is such a, a, a unforgiving environment. Whereas you pull that back down to academy, um, you know, it's, it's long term. You're working on potential. Uh, you've got you know, good relationships, strong relationships with, with some of your young players and and even though they might have some darker skills and things like that, or be shy and disengaged, you, you're able to get under the fabric of these people over the two or three years you've got them, um, and try to, to to nurture that, haven't you? So it's a it's a different kind of it's a different kind of coaching. And, and, and delivering at that level as well, you can experiment a little bit with what you do. Um, I, th- I think when you when you describe it like that, I think that's fantastic because you get. You know, your top end Super League coaches are under a lot of pressure. They are looking at your, your marginal gains. And even though you're a coach within academy settings, it's a talent development environment. And, and coaching is completely different in that. You're not, you know, um, held to, to results on the weekend. So you might see each other as coaches, but you're completely different in your agenda and how you go about delivery. Yeah, I mean, fortunately, like, uh, like Ian Watson, who's at Salford. Um, he was my um, captain when I coach Wales, so we've got a good relationship anyway. And I know he's like, you know, Stu's got our kids. And the two people I'm working with there, Danny, who, who runs the new stuff, and Alex, the naturally inquisitive people, you know, they like, they, they, you know, they're not, they're, 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 there's no ideology imprinted in their minds that you get with some of your really, really good ex pros. This is how it needs to be played, that they, they, they want to know. So um, even though they've both been professionals, they've not, had, they've not had that experience where they've been, you know, Mashed over this ideology and playbooks and stuff. They're quite inquisitive. So, like, it is an example for you. You know what you can do with with, with the junior setup is like, you know, we've done all the you know the playbooks and laying the line and working off the fifties and the plays and and, and, and the systems at marker uh, and how that should look. Uh, we, we still decided at that at that organisation to chuck that out the window for the juniors. What was really clear about certain of the things that he wasn't. We, you know, we, we managed to persuade him that we'll give him, we'll give him players that can hit moving targets with the top of the shoulders, and they know how to play on the win. That's all we're getting. So therefore, now we, you know, and they know where to turn the ball over. It needs to be ten meters from the try line. Those three things. So everything we do in practice now is educating the players to play off a win or how to get a win, or what you do off a win. Now you win a, if you win a rookie defence, what you know you change. And so can you capitalise on that? And what does your defence look like to play off that? So. Uh, and then in attack, you know, so, uh, and even, even though when they come to come to us and at Salford, you don't, you know, it's different from you guys, you've got them for, we get people that have been surfed out at, at, at uh, Salford, I mean, uh, sorry, at Widnes, uh, people that have been, you know, the fourth or fifth best kid in Wigan, which coincidentally Salford do a good job of. So Matty Smith, uh, Leighton uh, uh, Ratchford, Stephen Ratchford, uh, Myler, who's at, so, uh, who's at Leeds now, so they get they get them kids and they do a good job with what we get, um, but that's what I mean by experiment. And we managed to change that and, and think to ourselves, right, okay, we need to play more uh, so they can react from incidental things that are happening within the game and things that are opportunity and how they would re- react to that. But they come to us and say, right, Stu, can't you just stop the session now and tell everybody where they need to be? Well, no, you've just whacked you've just whacked, whacked Lee by fifty points, and we never put a play on. You know, you just know what you're doing. And so, in the end, they swing round and they, and they get the buy-in from us. But they also, as well, they, they, I think they have a good understanding that we're experimenting as well. All right, we're challenging ourselves. And I say that all the time to them. I so listen, I've designed this game now to help you deal with, with leads pushing through and getting out the back, for instance. Um, and I don't know how it's going to work, but let's give it a go. 
and they make it work and there's a buy-in and there's some co-creation to what you're doing and they talk about what they need from it. Before you know, you've got a really, really good game plan in place that's dealing with something that, that's, uh, that's, that's you, you know, you'd have to do a schema from, there's the A, there's B, there's C, and then, but you know, so having an approach where things can be incidental and change, like the game is chaotic, um, so that's that's what academy coaching could look like, and I'm I'm quite happy with the way things are solved. But it's quite it's like the it, optimally I'm 60 now, 61, and I'm really glad I finally got to this is what it should look like. Does that have I give you too much there, or you know just feel free to stop me? And no, I think it. absolutely fantastic. I think you know that's right in our wavelength. You know the way the way me and Danny operate, and, and, and like I say, I think we was quite lucky in that respect. You know, going back to our conversation earlier of when we was. Uh, at the City of Hull, you know, and, and it wasn't sort of that um, preconceived ideas of this is what it needs to look at, you know, uh, or this is what you need to do. You know, we had almost a blank canvas of, of the way we work. And, and that's, you know, we work in the same way now, you know, like say, um, because ultimately just giving them all that shape and structure makes them really good at playing shape and structure and, and not solve the problems themselves. And unfortunately, we're not playing at the same time as they are. And that's all that intentional stuff that you need to do. You, I just taught now, you could not do that at first team level yet. You know, hopefully like the next generation of coaches will have some players that can do that. You know, they've got, they can do more creative. I remember uh, uh, when I was at a major club, a golden boot winner coming up to me and he said, I love what you're doing on a Tuesday. And I was doing this stuff, working with a senior team. He said, but don't bloody do that before we are on our last team run. You know what I mean? It's got a, it's about their rehearsals, and you could easily, you'll just knock us off and, and destroy our confidence. Because they were, they were, you know, when you when you coach like that, players go home frustrated. Oh yeah, go through that ugly spell. But the transfer is massive to games, and so you know, so we're starting to do that with senior teams, and they're like, you know, that more chaotic stuff that what it looks like. It's nice early on in the week, they weren't ready for it on game day or the day before a game, you know, last run needed to be clean and, and shiny and unrealistic yeah. uh, because it just knocks them off psychologically. So first team coaching, you couldn't have that yet, but I'm pretty sure one day that, um, you know, uh, coaches will be really happy that the, that the, that the, play, the players they've inherited from, from you guys are happy in the chaos. They don't mind it. Yeah, yeah. That- I think it's that adaptability that you know you're embedding within those players, and like you say, um, I think it's with the the players coming through the system of being coached that way, have got to become comfortable with being coached that way. You know, ultimately, mm. and it is about that. If you, so if you, if you you know if it is a chaotic game, if you think about the first ten minutes in the rugby match, you don't even resemble rugby. You know what I mean? So coach it. If it needs, if it's ugly and messy and confrontational, what does them first ten minutes look like? Everybody's fighting to get over until someone puts a smart kick in uh, 40 20 or there's a penalty given away, and then people fall into shape, don't they? So, unless you if you let you don't, don't coach those un, un, uncompromising uh, things in, in, in academy, uh, they're never going to nurture and go through to be able to, and let it take them years to do it to you know to get up there, like some of the key, key people you want to know, like uh, Scully and, 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 and Lee Brears, they were really really interesting, weren't they? Uh, and even like how Foley views it as well, he really likes that co-creation stuff, doesn't he? So unless unless you want them to be independent, you need to. You, you're not coaching it; not going to be, are they? No, I think the co-creation thing there is massive, especially for buying. You know, you're getting it's almost like alien to get a player's opinion when ultimately they might have better ideas than you are. They're the ones we all see things in different ways, and if it's, your playing group understand things differently on a field. They're the ones doing the job, so why wouldn't you encourage their involvement and their perception? Exactly. Yeah. So even, just on. even when you even when you design your games, you you'll know what you want because you two guys and, and mostly the academy coaches, they've got all the technical and tactical stuff, all the sports craft in the back pocket. There's there's, there's no problem saying right. This is you know I've, I've limited the space. What skills do you need for this short space? Oh, you can't use a block play. Well, what skills do you need? Show sure, me. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Man. It's just doing the half of an ad line and not flawed. Well, let's see you've mastered that then. And you've mastered that game and, and, and let them that like um, search and discover and exploit these skills that you need really. Um, that's that's academy coaching and it's completely different to what happens at the scenes. You get a lot of um, reference to do you coach core skill? Um, 
we aren't seeing much core skill going on in chaotic environments like that and small sided games and constraints kind of led approach to coaching. What would your take on that be when you say there's no core skill development going on in these games? Yeah, well, it's not. It's about that skill adaption, isn't it? So you know, I mean, I know you've been asked a question at some point about skill acquisition. Now, there's already a knowledge framework with the kids we've got. Um, you know, so it's really about getting them to 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 for those, that that dexterity and those finite skills. Um, a player, a, a, it's a typical a player who spot recovery game. You know what I mean? So the only way you, it's an end game, so you can pass in any direction. But you can't pass it like that. You roll it on the floor. All right, so it's bouncing all over the body plays. It's chaotic, and they've got to be strategic when they get it in terms of moving into space after they've passed. Uh, but you just pick the ball and you pass it off the floor. So um, that's an end game, all right, a really messy end game. Um, but there's some core, core control and adaption taking place because a rugby ball will just bounce at you and come at you. so unpredictable. There's not one catch the same. So it's a different repetition. Um, and the, the buzz off it, you know it's useful. So if and they're 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 more like small sided games, but the more skill biased games. So there's some interesting research on skill biased games. It's really popular in rugby league skill biased stuff. And the, a lot of the Australian coaches bought it over um, because I mean I mean I know we all rave on about teaching games and understanding, but I, I don't use it in academy because it, they're not learning. The knowledge framework's already there, so we can actually hurt them a little bit, and and and, and that's called purpose. Of, uh, Reputation, that you actually make it really, really difficult for them to do. Okay, because the knowledge framework's there, we're not teaching them how to do, how to play the sport. We know it. We've just got to make sure that they're adapting those skills in different ways. So, skill bias game sits well with academy coaching and rugby league, really. And you see, and that's really popular. So, even though they might not know they're doing it, that's quite the closest piece of research or a small guided sided game approach that we use quite a lot is, is skill bias games. Um, so it's basically, you know, constraining the rules, um, so they've got to conform. Does that make sense? So does that answer your question about core skills? Absolutely. A good example of there's some core control there uh, in, its, in its crudest form, um, and there's some teamwork and decision making, and there's some uh, understanding of those shapes and movement and what we need to be able to do. But the ball's on the floor; they've got to pick it up and pass it across the floor, and it's unpredictable. Yeah, so I think like like with with that, you know, we mentioned about skill acquisition, just sort of moving on to to that as you as you just mentioned. I think we we sometimes get bogged down with it looking messy, like Danny was saying there. It's it's almost um, coaches almost feel under pressure, you know, from from what's being perceived on the outside, um, and it probably um, goes against what they're trying to do with within skill skill acquisition. How do, how would you see skill acquisition in practice? I think you know you you have. Um, I know, like you know, a lot of people use the fits and pulls and stuff, and it, and it, and it fits what we've done really well. Um, and I can understand why it's still kicking around, you know. And it should be too, you know, the cognitive associated and autonomous, and um, and that sat well with the schema theory of doing. Let's do A well before we do B well before we do C well. And let's go back and do A better. And this, this and you develop two hundred ways to do a two V one or play the ball and things like that. But I'm more about I think you know. And don't get me wrong, I use that when I was first setting off, because that's all that was out there at the time, and I was I being educated. But it's more, I, I love the Bernstein stuff, me, where it's more about, con, you know, you, you control, okay? So you're getting, you're getting used to um, a, a skill, and it's messy, and it's ugly, and there's a, there's, there's a lot of noise, and there's a lot of voice, and there's a lot of verbal stuff taking place. There's you guys saying, good, bad, no, try this. That's taking place. And before you move, so you've got control, and then you start to move towards assembly. So assembly replaces a, a associate, all right? So you're starting to assemble stuff, right? This is where this fits in, okay? And now I can do different versions of this, okay? Uh, different types of tackle, different types of passes in different situations. And then you move on to optimizing, which replaces for me, um, you know, the autonomous phase. So you're optimizing everything in and around the environment. You cut, you, you're connecting with, with, with players who are running the lines and things like that. You know, it's a, it's a, I think, it, you know, the games-based approach is more about um, control, assembling and optimising, okay? So you can really align to all the messy, chaotic stuff that will take place. And this space and all of a sudden, it's, it's, it's a, there's something changed in that. And uh, even though you're carrying the ball, there's somebody, you know, 
of, of the read the situation where the, the gap's closing quicker than what they anticipated. So does he, does, he, does he hang back and get the ball early or does he accelerate through the space? That's adaption, all right? So if you have a games-based approach, for me, those phases, um, I think that fits better than than the, the, the cognitive associate and autonomous cognitive model that we all that we've been indoctrinated with in Coach Ed over the years, really. So sorry to get a bit more lecturey on you, but you know, in terms of practice, it needs to be uh, messy and chaotic. But inside that, there's a, there is an actual sequential model. Yeah. Uh, that, that people like Bernstein and that wrote about, which is control, assemble, optimize. Within that type of training how do you provide feedback or how is feedback taking place in training with that yeah, so when they get to those uncomfortable places Danny you know what I mean and you, 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 you know you, you've got to ask you know everything in terms of discovery whether you've got to ask supporting questions so you just you know you just even pull them in you say right talk to me guys where's the difficulties at what's not working for you um, and if they can't you, see, you give them you give them some time to right, go and have a conversation go away come back talk to me when you come up with a solution and then you've always got a smart backdrop of having a skill breakout zone where somebody really is struggling with you know, break away man. So you've got you know you've got your default with your skill breakout zone, but it is about having conversations with them, getting them to talk about their perceptions and their difficulties. And then you, you as a coach can start to coach and assemble what's emerging. Right? And I get the same way if you start to get really good at something as Kessie and making sense of it. Again, you'll pull them in and say, I've got another challenge for you. Um, that can be anything. So with our guys, um, I quite often say, I, I like that tricks, me. So that, you know, uh, Nick, Nick might, Nick's that trick might be um, three results in a tackle. So in, inside the game, he's got to get three wins in a tackle where yours might be three push throws. All right, so did you get your three push throughs? Did you get a count because he's not doing this? All right, they're not holding them properly. All right, I can't get a win because I'm, 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 I'm getting in low, but nobody's coming over the top or I'm hitting the ball and got some leg drive on me. So the dialogue starts to take place about the difficulties that they're having inside that, that environment, if you like. So, you know, we know our stuff. We've just got to have confidence we've got in our, our back pockets that as things emerge, we've got an answer for the players and some advice or a challenge with that high level support that, we've, that we know we've got. So you, you know, you, they'll always provide you with, 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 with an opportunity to feed back. I think with, when you're talking there as well, individualising everybody's <laughs> development within one main session, you've got a game going on and everybody is challenged according to their needs and talk about player buying. You know, who's not going to buy into something which is all about them? You know, in a game, you know, when I was playing, I'd be the little skinny kid on the wing and touch the ball once in a season. And, you know, disengaged. Whereas yeah. something like that, I'm all over it. So if you've got a fullback that needs to get into some space into the next hole on a play and he's not getting it, who's he going to have a conversation with? He's going to go straight to his half and his back row and he said, for God's sake, why not that man on third in? I can't get in at all. I'm going to leave this game without the hat trick, fellas. All right, so straight away the dialogue's taking place, isn't it? All right, with just a subtle challenge like that, he did an hat trick. Let's differentiate with the hat trick. So the fullbacks have got to hit the hole outside that walk line. All right. So he'll be riding his back rower to get on that man on, on that man's inside shoulder. So all the stuff that them interactions that take place when they're playing in the 80 minutes, you've got control of in the game because you've set the environment to do so and you've given them some smart challenges, all right, in that chaotic environment. And yes, it's sequential. Control, assemble, optimize. So you get where you want in the end anyway. Does that, does that answer where skill acquisition is for the end? Definitely, definitely. Uh, I think we've, we've been there as well, you know, that's something that you touched on a lot and you mentioned within, there's just those relationships, the managing those relationships between, you know, the peers, you know, so player to player, but also, you know, player to coach as well and letting them, um, you know, problem solve in those situations. I think that's, you know, massively apparent with what you described them within there. But if I ever give anybody an advice in our sport, master relationships and the building of relationships, it's vital. I mean, I, I, when I first set off, I knew, I knew you know, like I, I had to be the friend and I had to show that I cared and stuff like that. But um, I quite like a lot of the stuff from, from, from Ericsson early on. When, when he, in Bloom's chapter, they talk about, he had like a three-stage model. His first stage was romance. Okay. 
So and, and it's not kissy touchy feely romance. The romance could be in around the challenge that we've given, the hatch that we've given them, or right? with, with your students an assignment or a task that they've got. So you start to develop a relationship, all right, in and around, all right, their task. Okay, and how it works, what Erickson talks about, you need commitment in the end in terms of a relationship. But you're not going to get commitment without some romance and some affection. And from affection, you get trust, and eventually, you get commitment. All right, so when you meet anybody for the first time, or a new player, or they're coming in, all right, they've got to have that period of romance. All right, without it, you're never going to be able to demand or look that even that they'll be able to display any integrity and commitment to you at some point. So relationships for me are, uh, is a really, really essential skill for development of any coach. Um, and, and to do that really well, you need to understand how you do that and how you develop your rapport. And to understand how you develop rapport, you need to have really good emotional intelligence as well. Like just simple things when you know it's messy and everybody's getting frustrated in practice. Pull them in, talk to me. Ask them a question. What, what, what's happening that's frustrating you? What can't you see? You know, so... Um, and, 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 and giving them an opportunity to be able to exchange some stuff with you there. But you're not going to get that from them unless you really, really give them an opportunity to develop some affection towards you and, and the club. And that's when you get a come on, all. you know what I mean? And they're always going to turn up on time. They're always going to have the kit. There are, things fall into place if you're smart enough to make sure that when they first come in, whether they're new in or it's a new cohort, or you're taking over a new team, and that they're allowed to have a, a peer of romance so they can develop some affection and commitment and trust towards each other and they do it with each other too. With the first team, the first team environment, I suppose that's probably going into what Jamie Langley was talking about a few weeks back about like social capital and getting those players to, to build those relationships. Mm -hmm. And I think that would, would look different at first team environment um, as it would in an academy. I think and one of the questions we've got on there, which I'll bring in now is, parental engagement, you know, when you was working at, at Leeds and having to work with those players to build that romance. A big player in that is the parents. So how do you manage that relationship and what role did they play? Yeah, I mean, so, if, you know, like nowadays, I mean, unlike you guys, you'll have, you'll have, a, you'll have a, a performance pathway that's, that's you do uh, loads and loads of support for your parents. And that's evident everywhere now, isn't it? You know, and it's not a good pathway unless... You know, the, those stakeholders are, are, are involved in, you know, educating them. I've got so many funny stories I could tell you um, about about why it's important. So, like, in, when I first set off coaching, I mean, um, I, I just thought I'd go down to the village, where, the next village where I lived and coach the under 12s. Uh, I, had no, I had no idea about kids. Uh, but I, and, 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 and the parents, all the next professional stewards coaching our kids. And my parents looked after me. They got me to grounds that I'd never been to in years. They, you know, they rallied around for all the kids and stuff. And they, that was an insight into me thinking, oh, crap, what a brilliant workforce I've got at my disposal here. Because it's one thing for sure, because they've been a professional. And you rugby players weren't built on the pitch. They're built in the kitchen. They're built at home. They're built in the lifestyles. They're built in all the things that were when they're not with you. Okay, so who are they with? They're with the peers and the friends. So it makes sense for, 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 to make use of those people. So yeah, while they were there, you know, straight away, you know, they started to take care of stuff. Um, and some of them, are, you know, they're just more than willing to help you uh, in, in different ways. So then moving forward a few years, now that becomes deliberate. How can I, how can I, you know, like, so sometimes it happens innately, you know, you just provide them with a room to stay in. So if you've got a training ground like you guys have, it might be an area where they go and have a cup of tea and we'll chat and we'll talk about the, the, their experience and what they're doing. That's a brilliant place to start having, you know, trusting your coaches to go out there and do a good job and, and just going in there and having conversations with them and then start to, to form uh, parent groups, all right, uh, providing a, 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 with, a, with a key person to come and feed back to you. And, it's, and, and sometimes that's intimidating. Like, so I remember at Leeds when I tried to do it and I, walk, I got them all into a room and I walked in and Gary, Gary Schofield stood there. And uh, what absolutely brilliant fella. And he got it like he needed to look like it does. Right, roll it forward, ex old captain Russ Walker. Another brilliant example of somebody that would, right, come here parents, I've got this shoe, off you go. And we're all teammates as well. So, you know, Russ had me back with them. And, and then they've got a voice of, of, of trying to understand what's taking place. And how they manage expectations as well, because there's 22 kids and you're only going to pick six, aren't you? 
All right. So how that what that looks like in the beginning and how you're going to manage those expectations throughout the time where I live to yeah. eventually get to that point. I know a little bit more. Now. Sorry about that, guys. <laughs> So, so yeah, it's, it's sort of um, you know, turning that into a formal program, those previous experiences. But I'll, I'll, there's so many funny stories I can't share them with you because I know you put it on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> My parents are so crucial because you just don't know what's going to turn up. You know? So uh, I, I, I coached a, 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 a young traveller, all right, whose parents didn't know anything about rugby, all right? So they really, really needed a lot of support. So you can imagine, can't you? That we had this fantastic young player um, who was a, who, who was who, who was a traveller, um, but his, the parents had no idea what rugby league was, you know. So you know they needed a lot of support um, because they were certainly passionate about their young son making it in the game. So you know, and he did. He's done really well. He's, he, I won't tell you who it is, but he's, he's off being a professional somewhere now. He's got a good reputation for himself. Uh, but that's if you if you didn't have a performance parent uh, provision to be able to support them. Um, the chances are he would have pr pretty much fell into bad times or just been lost. Does that answer your question or? Yeah, I, I, I think that's that, that's huge, you know, um, something that we're, we're quite passionate about as well, you know, it's, it's something that is becoming more um, more of a focus point now, you know, with the, the, with the research that's there to, to support it. But, you know, a lot of the times, you know, it, it's done where, you know, the parents are kept at arm's length, you know, ultimately for these, for these boys to be able to develop and, and or any, in any uh, environment, the parents need to be support, supported through that pathway as well uh, and challenge, you know, rightly in the right way, you know, as they're progressing through. You know, we, we talked about, um, you know, within skill acquisition, we talked about mental skills as well uh, within there and how we embed mental skills. I suppose it's just as important to, to manage the parental um, mental skills within that framework as well. Yeah, and when you talk about psych in, in rugby league, it's so dynamic. Uh, over the years, I mean, uh, you know, I've, I've learned that it's about organisational psychology. You can't speak about sports psychology and how to develop some of the mental without being able to without being able to understand uh, organisational care psychology, social psychology, and sports psychology, and how they all interact. Uh, such as you know, the things you just talked about about organisational psychology, it's about that, that network and that environment in and around what's going on. So, um, you know, that, that's, that's essential with parents because they're supporting the, the, the player. Your social psychology, you know, so you talk about your, your impression management, some of the stuff that, that Langer's talked about. Um, you know, you talk to your players about body language, yeah? Standing up, getting your shoulders back. That's not sports psychology, that's impression management. You know what I mean? So when you look at, um, doing a good job psychologically with players, it's quite, it's a, it's a quite a daunting task. Um, and for me, that's probably one of the biggest things, you know, that our sport needs help with, um, is, is, is making sure that if there was, if there was funds available, that every single club um, had a full-time cycle like it does with um, a conditioning coach that can work throughout the age groups. Uh, making sure that staff are being developed and there's some alignment to the social cultural factors um, because they're the people that really understand. I mean, I'm not a psych, but I know those things are important because I've been around good psychs that's developed um, a really good understanding about, like, right, you know, this psychology is an environmental factor. Um, talk about embedding it, and you know, there's a big talk, there's always been talking to you about the PDCEs. Um, they've been around a long time, I think they're a great resource. But they're not, they're not mental, you know, they're not, it's not psychology, all right? They're just one element, aren't they? It's just a resource that coach, coaches can use. Um, um, so I quite like Jack Lazic's 9 me, so I use them. Um, if you've never seen it, it's a really good model because it's already periodized. Uh, like a foundation phase, another phase, and a third phase. So three, three, three years they're with you, they start to, to get those, some of those key attributes. And again, the resource packed inside Jack Lazic's 9 that, that tells you how to implement them. But straight, can I share the screen with you or not? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we go. Yeah, yeah. Nine yeah. there, guys. Just, yeah. just the top hand corner. So you can actually see level one people skills, goal commitment, motivation, and attitude. So it's already periodized for you. So that's your first two on one. Then you've got your softer skills like mental imagery and self talk. And then your, your, your interactive ones like concentration, management of emotions, and managing anxiety. That's the first one I chose to use a while back. 
um, when I first set off at Leeds because it's been around such a long time, and that's because it was easy for, easy for me to organise. Yeah, uh, it's really good, really clear. I like that, and I think when you talk to players that have been successful, and, and the, the difference is around the mental attributes, so around work ethic, around resilience, commitment. So looking in there about motivation and an attitude at, at the bottom and commitment. A lot of things within community sessions is, is you know, we, we don't know anything about, about that. So how do we go about embedding it? A lot of coaches will do that without knowing. Hmm. So yeah, that's just like, that's just one example. And of course, you know, in, in, what we've got to try and do as, as coaches is develop resources to make these things happen, haven't we, in training? So, you know, what do people's skills look like? So that's not, that's, that is a social skill, that's social psychology. So how we interact how we can have conversations with, with, uh, with coaches and with each other. So, you know, year one, if you've got a shy, disengaged uh, number six with all the ability in the world, all right, what's he doing to lead his team? So say you might challenge him to, right, before we train today, I want you to go out and, and just while we're warming up and just say, Stuart, I've got the lads tonight. Uh, just a bit of a chat before we start to, start to run. And you might find that a really, really challenging task for him. But he's, he's, he's not going to make the grade is a number six without having those really good people skills. So you challenge him to, to start having conversations with the players and having debriefs with players after, after coaching or, and, and, and yeah, it's, it's a challenge for him because he's shy and disengaged, but he's a talented number six. So people skills and how he interacts socially are pretty important. Um, so if you go back to that again, so for me, you know, there's a bit, there's a bit, there's a bit of a myth about mental toughness in rugby league and, and um, I think you actually know what mental toughness is. Um, I see an old lady go to the gym every morning and she's got cancer, but she still turns up to the gym every morning. It's about that commitment, that confidence and that control. Okay. So I don't mind that. And I think it's good. And I think Clough did some really interesting stuff for mental toughness with, with resources that lines well uh, for you to be able to use. Um, and, and, and Jack Lesic's nine and the PCDs, those characteristics, they're just resources, resources for us to fit in. But I think the key for our sport because of the ambiguity in, the, in around mental toughness, is resilience um, and how resilient they are. And, and that, that's the best one for us as coaches to it's where we can interact with players. So if you've got high challenge, high, high, high support, you're there, all right? And you're not, like if you, Fordy was talking the, the other week there and it was really interesting and, and I can imagine it as well, that is in a stagnant environment with low, with low challenge, low support. Okay, so that you know, he, he was smart enough to understand that he, he needs to be in a high challenge, high support. Okay, so uh, and resilience is, is, is something that you, 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 can, you can actually help them come to terms with because it can leave you at any time. And you, as a coach, you, you know, you, you've gone 13 on the belt and you've got you're playing bottom of the league and uh, you've got them at home. Trust me, resilience can leave you, you know what I mean. And I just think about myself, I could train the house down. Uh, but there's no way of getting an ice bath. You know what I mean? Um, and it's, it's just, it fluctuates like that resilience um, and, and, it, and, it, and it fits really well with what we have to do and overcome it and being aware that this is a weak point around the corner. This is a banana skin waiting for me. What, what did I learn to help me overcome that? So then they think back to some of the experiences that you provided them with and the speed bumps and, and, and even sometimes you let them mess up that you can get a measure of how, 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 how resilience can fluctuate, all right? So there's nothing wrong with, it, with, 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 with an academy where you, you've had a run of, 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 of experiences that's ended, ended negative. And then, right, how do we, you know, so now, guys, training is going to look like this because we need to get back into that, that, that chaotic, uncomfortable environment uh, for you starting to be to, to behave properly. So pretty, pretty soon as they're going along, they're a bit like what Foy talked about, they start to develop their own mechanisms where they can they know where, that, where, where there's a risk in terms of resilience. So I'm a big fan of, of understanding resilience and keeping them in that high challenge, high support area, as opposed to, I think, I think then the mental toughness is a byproduct of that. It takes care of itself. And your art as coaches is, is, is creating those experiences for them. And those challenges, like we talked about, a shy disengaged number six, it might be absolutely brilliant, but it's not going to make it unless it can boss a team. We've got to develop those people skills, those social skills, that you can develop over time, um, where they can command a team and have a conversation with a group of people. 
Um, and I've done that. I remember sp speaking to him afterwards. Says, How did that go? Did he tell? Because uh, I got out of the way, so he didn't feel silly. He goes, "Oh mate, he just stood and listened." Because there you go. All right. Wednesday we do this. And I'm like, "Oh no!" <laughs> we get the top of it. So I hope that gives you a bit of an insight into into what you do. Yeah, you periodise it. You've really got to think about what you want to do with, with, with the mental side of the game. And you guys might have a completely different idea. You might think, no, I'm nailed on the mental toughness, or I'm nailed on the this and this. And this, and this. But I think, you know, you, you have to see how it all interacts. You have to understand sports like organisational psychology and social psychology. And that, that's too big for a daunting task for a coach. So, the, you know, any, any, any academy or any young coach needs to start tapping into uh, or having a mentor that's, that's skilled in psychology. Yeah. Uh Regardless of that lower level in terms of understanding of psychology, going back to when you spoke about having that romance, that relationship, that can act as that support anyway. As long as you care about that player, you're putting them into a high level of challenge and your support that is in his mates, you're going to have some kind of care and compassion within that. Just got keeping on resilience and mental attributes. I think at times as a sport, we can deselect too early based on perception of people not being resilient or tough you know how hard is it not only obviously psychologically but also from a physiological point of view to select talent at 13 14 years of age in rugby league is that something you find difficulty difficult i think it's always going to you know there's things you can do to narrow the funnel that you learn over the years don't you i mean if you think about like really making a, a club model um, so if it was to say to you either of you describe you're uh, someone you've had a conversation with, no doubt, uh, between each other. You, 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 you're optimum, what whole known for? What, what, what's the ideal characteristics of a whole player that you'd like your people to inherit and to be known for? Is that a genuine question? Yeah, yeah, what is it? I don't know if I'm I'm giving all my conversation about it. <laughs> I'll let you answer that, Rob. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think, like, say for us, we're we're looking on on five key areas, you know, for any player, and like we said said before, it's how we um, address them. I think we've we've gone away and going back to what you was talking about earlier of a specific uh, what a whole player looks like, um, because for us, it's making sure that, you know it's not one size fits all. And I think you know, going back to what Danny just said there, you almost deselect players if you if your your model is too rigid. Um, so we try to develop players within five key areas. Um, so mentally, like we just talked about there, uh, physical attributes, um, obviously their, their skill development, lifestyle and background, and then their, um, you know, their athleticism within there as well. Um, so you've, got, you've got your DNA then, haven't you? Yeah. Yes, if you like. You've got your DNA. That's your whole DNA. So essentially everything you do, all your energy, all your training, all right, um, all your planning, all your games, all right, everything you do throughout that year, all right, should just involve that. All right, so don't go off running um, something that doesn't match you. Like the, like the, 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 the sofa players, they need to know that when they get the ball, it finishes 10 metres from the opposition. Yeah. Right? So everything goes towards that DNA. You've got your DNA. Well, then you've got that. And, and so when a players are training, all right, they're being assessed and judged on how well they align to that DNA. And this is the stuff that I think Saints do really well. Okay, they've got their DNA. Okay, so yes, it's biased, um, and yes, you can deselect, uh, but then you might turn around and head coach say, "No, I want him." I say, "Well, yeah, okay, but it doesn't match what we do." So, can you? Are you? I remember being at a club and there was a really, really good halfback. All right, and he was totally unusual, right out the box. So the kid's gone on and had a good career. All right, and. He kept the coach kept saying to me, he needs to run a side, he needs to run an edge. He's not that type of player. All right. My challenge is to you, head coach, are you sophisticated enough to transfer that talent? Can you manage him in your environment? So I think you don't deselect them, you just make people aware that if they, if they, if there's a space on the succession that they can get through, all right, there is some limitations to what they do. We talk about resilience, there's loads of super played players getting around that are soft, that are massive. And they get wins because of the size. Do you know what I mean? So the game, the game does allow them in, but us as, us as talent developers, I think ultimately that's, that's the space. 
you need to make sure that you've got your DNA, all your energy is going towards that DNA, whether it's three to five or two things, all right? Um, and then it, it stands out who, who, who aligns to that DNA, who is going to be, you know, like, so people what, you know, a Parramatta and a Penrith player in, in, in the NRL stand out. A Saints player stands out. A whole player should be able to stand out, no matter where he goes in Super League. That he's got that DNA that you've recruited him for. And yes, there's some confirmation bias with that. All right, but it does shrink your foot. It does shrink your funnel down. It does make it easy, easy to, to to think about where your succession lies. Um, and it does, you know, you can identify people that might need a number nine. In, um, you know, the, what's it called? The hooker that you've got at home been really good for years the captain. Out yeah you've got you you, have, you guys will have a replacement there now but is he in that mold you know what i mean and if he isn't people are aware of the first team coach is aware of it brings some other stuff all right but you need to you need to finish him off as well there is some gaps uh, but he does offer something that's different and yeah we, i think i think that's the nature of what we do we might we might just deselect too early um, I'm, I'm right into to what the rugby union are doing about late, late talent confirmation. You know, I think they're about 17 or 18 now. Um, and I think, you know, uh, uh, we can afford a sport and I think we've got enough respect for each other. We can actually should be able to start moving towards that, you know. So, you know, as close to maturation as you can. Um, and, you know, understanding that you have got a, a model that you're working towards and are they aligned to that? And, it, and, it, and if they're not, what's, what's your system and your coaching about? What's your, what's your overarching philosophy in your academy? Is it leading towards that? You know, so, you know, Saints have, have fantastic players who play off the cuff. There's no doubt about it that their practice will look like that. You know, um, Hope, Hope have, 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 are known for being like tough middle unit people, aren't they? I can't remember when I had a good half, but can you tell me? We've got some good halfbacks now. Yeah. <laughs> One of them was a Salford lad. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, yeah. So you got him from Castleford in the end, didn't you? Um, but, you, you know, my point is, you, you, all the times when we're coaching against still, you didn't need a good halfback. You were a threat. It's a big, tough lad. Yeah, you were a threat somewhere else. And there's nothing wrong with that. It brought you loads of success. That has had some brilliant success with, 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 um, with the team he's had. You know what I mean? So that's your DNA and where it's about, you know, you're, you're a team that might not need, you just need somebody like that can kick goals and, and uh, put some players on and kick to the corner and you've got one. And then you, the rest of the guys just grind it out on everybody, don't they? So mm. that's your DNA and where it's about. So, you know. Very, very kind of specific and tailored to um, clubs. And I think you're absolutely right on the money there. Knowing what you want as the end goal, having your, your clear vision of your DNA and working towards that. I've read something you put out this year or last year around uh, rugby pathways, talent pathways, and, and what that looks like mm. over the years. Um, what's just on that? What do you think? Yeah. If you had all the resources in the world, what would a talent pathway look like in rugby league ideally? Can I just go back again, please? Danny? Yep. Just, so just about about what about your own DNA. So some of the stuff that I'm researching at the moment to help, and I'm doing a PhD in in in, um, in talent development in rugby league. So hopefully, the, you know, it'll be, it'll be great use. So if you think of something like um, I don't know groundwork or escaping from a tackle that we teach, and we um, so so uh, one club in the northwest, I'll have an actual dojo in its gym. All right, an area where that takes place. Okay, and so it's really important to them wrestle and contact. Okay, um, five miles down the down the road, they won't have a they won't have a dojo, and they just practice escape on the grass and on the astroturf outside. Both get results. Both done completely different ways. All right, that's that social cultural influence that you do. All right, everybody gets the same result, but because you are as a club. Uh, your organisers are probably have different views on things, all right? Everybody's successful, okay, but you just have different journeys and how you deliver stuff and what you're known for. So, and that's, that's, for me, that's, you know, it might sound obvious, but that sort of tells you don't do what Hull do. If you're at Hull KR, don't do what Hull do. You know, if you're at Hull, you don't do what Castleford do. If you're at Castleford, you don't do what Leeds do. You do you've got to work out what you guys have done, what's your DNA, and it all guides towards that. Now, if, if I was going, winding forward to your last question, hopefully, 
I think you know the the, the role of a, a, a psych uh, that can develop its coaching workforce. Um, I think that, you know uh, I'd love to have been ahead of youth having you two guys coming through. You know what I mean? So you know, fortunately, you know like the, the things have evolved so much, haven't they? You know, so when we set off, they were, I think <coughs> the only thing that was kicking around then there was a sport. I think sports science degrees were just starting to appear. And sports development, but in, you know, when we, when we were playing sport, it was just a PE degree. So now that the, the, the intelligence and the workforce really grown, you know, this, 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 you know, everybody's got some really really good transferable skills. Technology's improved, resources have improved. You know, what I mean, uh, the personnel that you've got on your uh, uh, on your on your on your academy workforce are coming in with degrees, and you know, they've got some specialisms in around what they do. But definitely, you know, uh, that, that's what's changed more than anything else, that your you, you volunteer and your professional workforce have loads and loads of good skills. Um, whereas when we were doing it, it was like a bricklayer or a joiner, and you had to give them uh, some understanding and, and a lot of personal development. Um, so that's what's changed more than anything else, is that who, who populates the academies is so strong now, I think we're in a brilliant position. Uh, to really, really, you know, like now like with some of the conversations we've had about how you should coach academies and, and what it should look like, um, and perhaps there's a shift that, that needs to be like that. Um, but I, I think essential for every club is a psych, a really good psych. They have great strength and conditioning coaches and they have science and everything else and technology to support them. Look at the, the like I said, the population has changed, so the, the coaching workforce has gone up. Yeah, uh, but having a psych embedded into what you do, I think, is essential uh, for us to really blossom. Not just for the players, but for, for aligning, like we've talked about, about DNA, for organisational structure, for that philosophical alignment, for connectivity right the way through. They can really develop the workforce, never mind the players. Um, and that that would be would be where I put my major investment is that there was there was there, there was some ring fence money to to employ that essential part within your club. I think Leeds Rhino was one of the first to do it. They took Darren Robinson on a, on a who's a, a coded on a full part time role. Mike Gregory, all those years ago, uh, left Simon Worsen up at home. He'd been on the project for two years. Uh, didn't take him to New Zealand. He was a strength and conditioning coach because he decided to take a psychologist with him, um, which was groundbreaking at the time. Um, but the contribution that those people have made to my growth as a person and the people around them and that generation of people, I think, is priceless um, and cannot be underestimated. So that's where I'd go, Danny. I'd definitely go. And I'm not a psych, but I'm informed by one. And I know I, can't, I, couldn't, I couldn't run an effective academy without that support. Dan's your question. Um, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Thank you. I, I think it's uh, it's been absolutely brilliant, um, and it's been great having you on, Stuart. We've just got two more questions to sort of uh, round it off, but you know, not to sort of uh, put words in Danny's mouth. But I think it'd be great if we to have you on again and uh, to go over some some more stuff. Uh, as, you know, another point as well because I think there's so much value in there for, for coaching. Well, there's loads. You could have we could have gone anywhere you wanted to do. Yeah. Into coaching and practice, so you know if you ever need anything, there. Yeah. Definitely. Um, just two questions left. So I've got one, and then Daniel throw one at you. Um, but this is a, a question that I've been asking everybody. So, what is your favourite drill, practice, game? Anything that you enjoy delivering, and why? Um, I, I love um, some of the one-on-one -on -one games. You know, some of the evasion stuff and, and getting the bodies to move in uncomfortable, unusual positions and things like that. So whenever I work with a new group, it's a banker um, because straight away within seconds, smiling faces, everybody's laughing, it's competitive and they're discovering new ways of moving. Um, so can you imagine like we have rugby players, so you've got like someone who's six foot on a little halfback and he's got to go down and try and grab his feet or his ankles. It's a long way down, isn't it? But of course, it's completely connected to being able to put yourself in a decent position to hit him with a shoulder and not grabbing him with an arm tackle. So there's some connectivity towards what I tried to do, and I sort of went, one of the first sessions to do was right. Let's 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 do some of these games. So little one-on-one -on -one games, and then I turn it into a two-on-two, -two, and then it's three-on-three, -three, and it's four-on-four, -four, and it sort of builds up from there. So that's that's probably been my banker really, and it, straight away there's this engagement, and there's, there's some eagerness and there's some competitiveness, and there's some movement and fun within all what you do. So I sort of start there really. Um, and that's one, you know, just, just straight away, like say, having fun. So I think building that 
that romance, if you like, and when you go into a new new environment and, and getting those smiles on faces, ultimately that's what it's about, and you, you get that buy in early early days, don't you? Do you, know, you have little over the years you get little benchmarks as well when you're doing it. So you know, like we work on a carousel, don't we? Because I've only got them for a couple of hours sometimes. Um, and, and and one of the coaches has said, right, you finish that now, over to Stu. And they run over. They're bombing over all together at the same time. You know you've got them. Do you know what yeah. I mean? Stuff, stuff's working. They're there. But if you got for a stew, and straight into it. And uh, that's your benchmark that your stuff's working, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, and, and I think, yeah, games basically, you get that buy-in and eagerness, don't you? And the banter starts straight away. Definitely. Yeah, and you know, they, they're great just to set up on the side of the pitch. You know, if you, instead of going for a drink or if you need a little breather as a community coach and want to set something up, you've got them grid set up on the side of the pitch. The boys can just go and carry on and self-police a little competition. It's only like what you used to do in the garden when you were kids, play 1v1 and, and make your own rules up. I think me and Rob will video, we'll have a go at that, Rob. So you knew <laughs> and yeah, video yeah. that and see. I'll tackle you around the ankles. <laughs> <laughs> I'll drop the ball. The, um, the last question, Stu, would be, if you could ask any player or coach, past or present, in any sport, any question, what would it be? And why would you choose that question? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a strange one, this, but there's a, there's a person I've always wanted to meet. Um, so when you, when, you, when you talk about some of the really, really smart coaches that kicked around here, like David Waite and Tony Smith, um, some of the good players that have been over, like Trent Barrett, um, there is a common thread who they speak about. There's a gentleman called Max Ninnis, okay? And I think they've got him locked away in an office in St. George somewhere, so he can't get out. But everybody speaks about how, what, how, what a guru he was, all right? He's the person that, that's like Brian Smith would take anywhere with him. Tony Smith speaks about him quite well. David Wake speaks about him quite well, and I've never met him. And there's nothing out there on him. All right, so he doesn't tweet, he doesn't share stuff, he's never done a lecture anywhere. But everybody you speak to about him um, talks about what an intense and uh, brilliant coach he actually was. Tony actually said about him, he used to say, and, and, and Trent was the same, he used to say to actually say, I, I, I'm dreading going to see um, Max, but Brian told me to go and speak to, to Max. And I've got some work to do from him. So I'd love to have met, met, met Max, I think, and asked him 101 questions on, on, um, on, on his legacy, if you like, and how he did it. And so he's, he's a really inconspicuous character. He's not, a, he's, he's not an icon in our sport or known that we do. But who was, who was the brains behind Tony Smith and Brian Smith and David Waite and some of those great players like the Jones brothers? All right. So they'd all, in those backgrounds, there was a really, really... Uh, significant person called Max Ninnis. I've Googled him once and got his picture, but it's about closer to him. I've been to Australia a couple of times when, when, I, when, when I was at Leeds, Gary allowed me to go, but I never got in a room with Max. I think that could be a Netflix series, that, I found Max Ninnis. <laughs> Good, isn't it? Brilliant. Absolutely. First off, I just want to uh, say thanks. Uh, we really appreciate your time, Stu, for coming on. Um, like I just alluded to there, it'd be great to have you on again at some point and we'll and we can maybe unpick a little bit more and uh, and look at certain areas within the game because I think you can have so much value in there for, for coaching the conversations we've had. So from me, uh, thanks for coming on. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Stuart. My mind is, is going all over the place about things that we could start implementing just on some nuggets that you dropped in there. So I really appreciate that. And I, I do agree with Rob. Maybe drop you in again at some other point. If you're okay with that, we're very grateful for your time. It's a good time to do it, and thanks, guys. And, and again, we've got some brilliant people in our sport, and you're doing a great job getting them out there. I mean, unfortunately, the, the, you know the, the, the margins in, in rugby league because we all do the same are very, very small, so we don't share. Uh, but we, you know, we're not talking about where we lay the line out. We're talking about some some fundamental things here. And the more we share it, uh, I think the, the the greater our status will grow um, in some of the communities out there in coaching and talent development. So thanks for having me on. Um, and, and keep up the good work, fellas. It's fab.